Welcome back, my friends. So in the previous lesson, we looked into the five factor K1, K4, K6, which is common to all the design capacity calculations. Now I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown on tension members, which you can find on clause 3.4. Apart from all the common factors, for tension design, now we have to find FT and AT. FT is the tension strength parallel to the grain. In timber design, you will often hear the term parallel to the grain or perpendicular to the grain. If you look at this image, you can see these lines and they are running longitudinally in the member. So they represent the fibers or the grain of the timber. So we're gonna deal with forces parallel to the grain. So imagine the grain is running longitudinally. So if you compress a member, that's a force parallel to the grain, or if you pull a member, that's a force parallel to the grain. But then we can also apply a force that is perpendicular to the grain. FT is tabulated, so you can just go to table H2.1 or table H3.1, or just check the specs from the manufacturer. And then AT is the tension area, which is the minimum net cross-sectional area. When you pull a member, the forces will have to bypass the bolt holes. That's why the net cross-sectional area is the gross area minus the hole areas. So you can see on this image that when the forces bypass the holes, the only cross-section of material left is a little bit above the holes and a little bit below the holes. A member in compression is a different story because if the hole is filled with a bolt, the force is going to push the boat and the boat's gonna bear on the side face of the hole and then that force is gonna be transferred back again to the whole cross section of the material. So for tension calculations, we just use the minimum net cross sectional area. When are we gonna have to do this type of calculation? Basically, if you have to design a cross bracing, you know cross bracings, they're always in tension, or maybe you have to design the web members of a truss, then you're gonna have to design for tension and compression. So that's basically a couple of examples that you might come across in your design. Hey, real quick, if you are a structural engineer in Australia or studying engineering, I've put together a free webinar that shows you how I map out and detail connections like timber to steel, steel to concrete, and much more. It's based on an actual timber framed residential project here in Australia and it's packed with tips, examples and practical advice. It's free, click the link and I'll see you there. Now let's jump to the design capacity of compression members. You're going to find everything that you need on clause 3.3. There is a link here that takes you to a timber column design. So there's an example where I go through the design of a 100 by 100 F17 unseasoned hardwood column. We're gonna go through this example together in another lesson, but for now I'm just gonna go through the basic aspects that you have to understand about compression. So for compression, the extra factors that we have is K12, FC and AC. I'm gonna come back to K12, the stability factor in a second, but as we discussed, AC, which is the whole cross-sectional area, as long as the hole is filled with a bolt. Again, if you're compressing a member, you're compressing the fibers, and then as a result, those fibers will compress the bolts, which will bear on the fibers again, and then there's a smooth transition of loads, and that's why you can use the whole cross-sectional cross area. However, if that hole does not have a bolt, then it's a different story you have to use the net cross-sectional area. So if you're designing a stud or a column or whatever it is, and then the plumber came in and drilled a hole in the middle of the column, when you design that stud or that, that column will be the net cross-sectional area. So it's going to be the gross area minus the hole that the plumber drilled through that member. Now, if we scroll down, we're gonna talk about slenderness. Columns and studs are slender members, so they will tend to fail by buckling. If they're not slender, let's say you have a fatty column, they're gonna tend to fail by crushing the material. If you're designing a compression member by buckling, you have to check for both axes because 
it could buckle about the minor axis or it could buckle about the major axis right there's a there's an image down here that you can check what I'm talking about minor axis buckling just buckling this way and then you've got the major axis buckling of course if it's a square column NDCX will be equal to NDCY but if it's a rectangular column or if it's a stud then they will be different you have S3 which is the major axis buckling and S4 which is the minor axis buckling now you might be asking yourself why do I have to check for the major axis buckling if the minor axis buckling is the critical one well because you can restrain the minor axis buckling so if I apply a restraint in the middle of this column all of a sudden it might not buckle about the minor axis it could buckle about the major axis so you must evaluate both S3 and S4 and choose the largest one have a look at this cross section the X axis is here and then the Y axis is here so that means when we talk about major axis buckling S3 we're referring to buckling about X axis and when we refer to when we talk about S4 minor axis buckling we are referring to buckling about the Y axis so Y axis buckles like this and X axis is gonna buckle like this if it makes it easier for you to understand just think that the buckling direction always run perpendicular to the axis if the X axis is running this way that means the buckling is gonna run perpendicular therefore buckling about X axis is the major one if Y axis is running this way the buckling direction is this way perpendicular to the Y axis that means we're talking about the minor axis buckling the way we calculate S3 and S4 if there's no intermediate restraint S3 is equal to the effect length factor G13 times the length divided by D and S4 is the same thing but divided by B and B is the width of the member and D is the depth of the member now what's this effective length factor G13 this factor is gonna model the condition of the end restraint for most cases I use G13 equals 1 which models a restraint at both ends in position only that means we have a pinned connection at both ends of the member even if I'm using a two bolts or even more bolts in my connection I would still use G13 as 1 and make it a pin connection to use G13 equals 0.75 you have to make sure your connection provides some stiffness and you also have the column connected to a stiffer structure when you get to the lesson of the design of steel columns we're gonna talk about the effective length factor KE and G13 is modeling what KE does so you have to understand that it's not only about the the fixity of the member it's also about the overall stiffness of the structure so don't think that because you have just two bolts in your connection that means you can use G13 as 0.75 you have to zoom out and look at the overall structure you can have a look at this table and compare it to the table of effective length for the steel column design lesson it's pretty much the same thing we have braced members and sway members so as long as your column is bolted at bottom at the top and is connected to a bracing structure we can use G13 equals 1 if you're using the column to brace the structure then it becomes a sway frame look at this image here then we cannot use G13 equals 1 even if you have two bolts or whatever it is you have it's going to be a sway frame all right don't worry if you're not getting it a hundred percent it will make more sense when you get to the steel column design lesson I explain in much more details in that lesson all right here's just a warm-up for you to understand effective length I give you some practical examples here you can have a check 
and then the restraints and then a little bit more information on what I'm trying to explain that you have to look at the overall system and make sure the structure is braced otherwise it becomes a sway frame. I like this image because it shows you that a restraint is only effective if it stops the column from moving in the direction that you are restraining it. So imagine that you have a bunch of studs, right? It's a wall framing. And then you put some noggings in between the studs. Just putting the noggings in between the studs does not mean you are restraining the studs. Because if you apply a compression force to the studs, they will all buckle together, right? There's nothing really restraining. However, when you introduce plasterboard and then the nails, or you have plywood bracings on the wall, now you've got a whole system. Now the noggings are actually restraining the studs. If you didn't have the plasterboard nail to the wall, you would have to consider the effective length of the stud as the full height. Now, if you have the plasterboard nail to the stud wall, you can consider the effective length as half height, like it's showing here. So imagine this brace to footings, this diagonal, imagine as the plasterboard. In structural engineer, we have to consider all possible scenarios that a structure might be subjected to. I'll give you an example. Let's say a brick veneer wall frame might only be cladded on one side because you have the timber, because you have the timber frame wall and then you have the brick. Usually you wouldn't clad anything on the side facing the brick, right? Because no one's going to see anything. Or maybe you're designing a house where there's a wall which is cladded on one side and then on the other side you just have like a, a decorative paneling, you know, some just some feature paneling. So it's a different scenario. You have restraint in only one edge. And sometimes during construction, the cladding will not be installed yet. So it will change how the wall behave under loads. Usually that's fine because during construction, you don't have the full loads applied to the structure, unless you're designing something where the construction loads are even higher, then it might be a problem. So just bear in mind that restraints must be in place at the time the load is applied to be considered effective. Table B3 is pretty handy. You can find some typical configuration for compression members. For a freestanding column, you're probably just going to use the effective length as the whole length of the column. For the studs in a wall framing, of course, the major axes have no restraint. And for the minor axis, you can consider the nogging spacing or the fastener spacing. I usually just use the nogging spacing. Next thing we're going to talk about is the material constant. So the material constant allows for the initial curvature of the column. That means that real columns, as you know, are not perfectly straight. This one is a great example. You can see that there's this ruler is not perfectly straight. And any column in real life is the same thing. It doesn't come on site perfectly straight. That means there will be an initial bending moment at the column. And then when we have a axial load applied, the deflection will increase and that will contribute to buckling as well. So that's what this material constant is modeling. So the material constant not only allows for the initial curvature of the member, but it also allows for creep buckling of the compression member and the ratio of stiffness to compressive strength. Creep buckling means that if a compression load is applied for a long period of time, the lateral deflection might also increase under creep. So let's say you have a permanent compression load. That means with time, the deflection will increase due to creep. The column might buckle due to the duration of the load rather than its magnitude. You can tell by looking at table 3.3 of AS1720.1 that each grade of timber has a different value of material constant. And then finally, K12, which is the stability factor, if we go back to our design capacity calculation, we can see that the K12 is the first factor in the red color, and that is the stability factor. You can find more details about K12 stability factor in clause 3.3.3. So basically, if you multiply 
the material constant times the slenderness, and that's equal or less than 10. That means we have a stocky member. That stocky member is not going to buckle. It's going to crush, and then K12 equals 1. As the slenderness of the material increases, we're going to have a material constant times slenderness between 10 and 20, and that means we have a transition from stocky to slender. Therefore, K12 is a little less than 1. You can work out K12 through this equation. And then members with high slenderness, which is mean material constant times slenderness greater than 20, you can find K12 through this equation, and it's going to be less than 1 for sure. So stocky members, K12 is going to be equal to 1. For a transition, you know, between stocky and slender, it's going to be a little bit less than 1. And then for high slenderness member, really slender members, it's going to be much less than 1.